Previously on the Dark Side of Love, 19-year-old Rachel Wade and 18-year-old Sarah Ludeman are locked in a vicious battle over a bad boy by the name of Josh Camacho, who is playing both girls against each other and telling them if they love him, they'll fight each other for him. Rachel and Sarah are all too happy to oblige, leaving each other nasty text messages and voicemails and increasing threats to stay away from Josh. And then, on one April night, the threats of violence turn into a horrible reality. Hello and welcome to The Dark Side of Love. I am your host, Bianca Sloan, author of suspense novels about the dark side of love. And this week I'm putting a spotlight on part two of the case I'm calling Triangle of Death. Bad girl Rachel Wade and good girl Sarah Ludeman are quite literally losing their minds over Josh Camacho, the freeloading player who already had a baby with one girl that he didn't take care of, didn't have a steady job, a car, or a place to live, was average looking, but somehow had managed to make these two girls contort themselves into the most convoluted of pretzels, vying for his time, his attention, and his love. He manipulated them into thinking that he was a prize. He was not a prize. Unfortunately for Rachel and Sarah, they don't see this. Blinded by I don't even know what, because they go after each other with both barrels. Rachel taunts Sarah by calling her fat and pathetic, and that Josh can get anything he wants from her. And what could Josh possibly see in Sarah, who, for her part, calls high school dropout Rachel a loser and a whore, and says that Josh has it so much better with her. So at one point, Josh has moved in with Rachel, I guess, part-time, I don't know. But he was living with Rachel-ish, um, who has her own apartment. Uh, so no wonder she's feeling so confident, because she's got him under her roof, so to speak. Of course, he is still stringing Sarah along, and instead of kicking this scrub to the curb, Rachel and Sarah continue to turn their vitriol on each other, Seriously, did we learn nothing from TLC? No scrubs allowed. Anyway, things continue to escalate between Sarah and Rachel, with Sarah driving past Rachel's apartment, shouting that Rachel should come out and fight her. And Rachel, for her part, her favorite pastime is to leave vile voicemails for Sarah. And she would later tell police that Rachel had once called her 20 times in the span of two hours. 20 times! in two hours. Who has that kind of energy or time? Oh, a teenage girl in love, of course. As former television reporter Serena Faison says in Max's Sex and Murder, quote, the most sane people can go insane over love, and boy, he had them in a frenzy. April 15th, 2009. As Rachel continues to be cocky about her relationship with Josh, and her feeling as though she's the one, a distraught Sarah is starting to feel as though she is losing the war. Rachel's never-ending posts on MySpace about Josh send Sarah into a spiral, and she begins to doubt that he will ever totally belong to just her. She and Josh are supposed to hang out that night, but Sarah needs to feel some firm ground beneath her feet. So she texts Josh, looking for reassurance that he still loves her, that he loves her best, saying, quote, whatever, Josh, you get so mad at me for everything, but you don't give a shiz when she puts something up or says something. You always believe her. It's like, no matter what I do, she's always that much better. All we fight about is her or something that has to do with her, and it sucks. I hate fighting with you. I love you so much that this shiz hurts. Hours later, Josh still hasn't responded, so Sarah tries again, texting, quote, You say you love me, but you don't even have the decency to text me back? And what does Josh text back finally an hour and a half later in response to this heartfelt plea? Bring the movies. Bring the movies. That's what he says to her after all that. What do you even say to that? 
As the Tampa Bay Times noted, late bloomer Sarah felt that she just couldn't compete with Rachel, who had a job, a cute little red car, and her own apartment, while Sarah was stuck with an 11 o'clock curfew and the keys to her parents' minivan, not to mention how pretty Rachel was. Sarah's friends shared with the Times that because Sarah had given Josh literally everything, all of her love, her time, her devotion, she'd even given up her magnet um, veterinary program at previous high school because she wanted to transfer over to Josh's school. She even gave him her virginity. Sarah was convinced that if Josh didn't want her, nobody else would either, and she just could not let him go. As Sarah's friend Amber Ayala told the Tampa Bay Times, quote, she knew he was owning her, but she never thought to leave him. If she'd had other boyfriends, she would have known how it feels to break up and get over it. But when your first love is at 18, things get epic. For her part, Rachel is feeling herself, convinced there was no way that Josh would ever kick her to the curb for Sarah. After all, as the Tampa Bay Times reported, Rachel was pretty. She worked. She had her own place, her own car. No curfew. And let's not forget that Rachel and Josh had known each other since they were kids, so their bond, in theory, was deeper. So even though Sarah didn't get the reassurance that she was likely looking for from Josh when she texted him in the form of, I love you, or you're the only one, if I had to guess, having been a teenage girl, the fact that he still wanted to hang out with her and watch movies that April night was probably good enough for her. She was probably over the moon. He wanted to spend time with her. Case in point, before Sarah slides behind the wheel of her mom's minivan to make the short drive over to Josh's sister's house for a night of hanging out and watching movies, Sarah posts the following on MySpace. I love you, baby. Meanwhile, a clueless Rachel is sitting at home thinking she's going to be seeing Josh that night. While she waits, she takes her dog for a walk when a car starts honking at her. It's Sarah on her way over to Josh's sister's house. Rachel claims that as she drove past her, Sarah screamed out the window, stay away from my man. Rachel claims that Sarah screaming at her like that scared her. And so, with Josh nowhere to be found and saying that she's afraid to be by herself, Rachel calls her ex-boyfriend Javier LeBoy and asks if she can come over and hang out with him. Javier agrees, and before she leaves, Rachel makes a fateful decision. She pulls a steak knife from Applebee's where she worked from her kitchen drawer and slips it into her purse. Javier tells 2020 that the reason Rachel did this was because she was afraid that Sarah was going to come after her and that she had no way to defend herself. It's 11 p.m. Sarah is still hanging out with Josh and his sister having blown off her 11 o'clock curfew so that they could play Wii. Her dad texted her wanting to know when she'd be home, and she texts back and says, soon. The headlights of a car slash the living room windows where everyone's sitting at Josh's sister's house. It's Rachel and her cute little red Saturn. She's been waiting for Josh all night, and she is furious to see Sarah's minivan outside, livid, as she realizes that he blew her off to hang out with Sarah instead. Sitting outside, she sends him an angry text message, quote, Now I know why you're not talking to me, because you got her. His flippant response? That's right. I don't like you no more. Why are you down this street? Go home. Rachel refuses, texting back that she would wait until Sarah went home. Sarah is afraid that once she leaves, Rachel, who has no curfew, will swoop in on Josh for the night. Apparently. Rachel changed her mind about hanging out, waiting for Sarah to leave because she left and went back to Javier's place. A little before midnight, Sarah finally, reluctantly, decides to head home. However, Josh's sister and her friend asked if Sarah would run them to McDonald's, and Sarah agreed. However, when the friend of Josh's sister blurts out that she just saw Rachel and knew that she was at Javier's house, for some reason, this triggered Sarah, and suddenly, the last thing she wants is a Big Mac. What she wants is to fight Rachel, 
And so she heads for Javier's house, determined to confront her sworn enemy. Sailor spots Rachel outside, leaning against her car, engrossed in a conversation with two boys. She slams on the brakes and leaps out of the car like a bull seeing red and races toward Rachel. The keys are in the ignition. The car is still running, the door wide open. Sarah is in full-on fight mode. Her fists are ready. Her anger is at 12, and she cannot wait to finally get her chance to pummel pretty little Rachel into the ground. Rachel has been waiting for this long overdue date as well. She raises her hand and rams it into Sarah's shoulder. She raises her hand again, and this time jams it into Sarah's chest. What nobody realized in those frantic, blurry minutes was that Rachel didn't just hit Sarah. She stabbed her. Remember that right before Rachel left for Javier's house, she put a steak knife in her purse? That's what was in her hand when she attacked Sarah. A stunned, bleeding Sarah stumbles back to the minivan and collapses into the driver's seat. And in those moments, Sarah's first thought is to call Josh, not her parents, Josh. Gosh, that's sad. Her hands are bloody and her cell phone slips and slides out of her grasp, but she finally manages to get a hold of him. When he answers, Sarah whispers, it hurts, before she falls out of the car and onto the street. Josh, who would later say he had smoked seven white owl bloods and knocked back five shots of vodka that night, somehow had the presence of mind to call Rachel, demanding to know where she was. She told him, and then Josh ran the short distance to Sarah's house, telling her dad that Sarah had been in a fight. They hop into Charlie's taxi and speed over to the scene. By now, paramedics are there, frantically working to revive Sarah. Meanwhile, Rachel had thrown the knife that she used onto the roof of the house and was just chilling. Seriously. In all of this chaos, after stabbing Sarah, the paramedics rushing to revive the girl, get her to the hospital, Rachel is just quietly sitting on a bench, a lit cigarette dangling from her busted lip. As her friend Jamie Severino noted to True Crime Daily, quote, Rachel was just sitting there with a blank look on her face. I don't think she really knew what she did. Sergeant Tina Trahey of the Pinellas Park Police Department said in Max's sex and murder, quote, she was very calm. She was very concerned about having a cigarette. She never once asked me how Sarah was doing, if she was alive, if she had passed. So police questioned Rachel about what happened. And initially she lied and said that Josh's sister had jumped her and beat her with a sandal. I will note that Josh's sister never got out of the minivan during Rachel and Sarah's fight. Finally, Rachel does come clean and tells them that Sarah had been bullying her and that she had a knife for protection because she was afraid of what Sarah might do to her. She was defending herself. Cops tell Rachel they're going to have to bring her down to the police station to ask her some more questions, and as Sergeant Tina Trey, he says in Sex and Murder, quote, she almost gave the impression like she was going for a ride. She would settle this, and she would be home soon. Not quite. While cops bring Rachel to the police station for more questioning, Sarah's parents and Josh are at the hospital, hoping against hope that Sarah will be okay. The hope turns out to be in vain. Sarah dies that night. Sarah Ludeman was 18 years old. Back at the police station, cops grill Rachel about what happened, and she maintains that she was defending herself. Throughout her interview, she's just not, like, there at all. Like, like her body's there, but the rest of her, her mind is just somewhere else. Like, she doesn't seem to understand that she has stabbed a girl who had to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. She is very nonchalant, bored even, like she's checking an item off her to-do list. Rachel continues to say that she was terrified of the bigger Sarah because Rachel's really petite. And cops are like, why didn't you run in the house and call the police? None of what you were saying makes any sense. 
and rightfully so, they are also incredulous at the reason for why these two girls are brawling with each other with one investigator asking all of this over Josh. I mean, that's right. That's what I'm asking. Josh, really? And finally, cops drop the bomb on Rachel about Sarah, telling her, quote, Sarah is dead. You killed her. This is what finally pierces the shield of nonchalance, and a stunned Rachel breaks down in uncontrollable tears. Rachel is charged with second-degree murder and was denied bail, meaning she had to stay in jail until her trial began. Sarah is laid to rest about a month before the senior prom she would not get to attend. Josh, who was at the hospital when Sarah was brought in, refused to see her then left the hospital altogether after she passed, so he never saw her again. He was banned from attending Sarah's funeral, and he dropped Rachel pretty fast as well. Never wrote her a letter, never visited her, and eventually his parents sent him out of town, foisting him onto extended family in New York. He would admit in a sworn deposition that he was sleeping with both Rachel and Sarah, as well as his baby mama, a girl named Erin. But that's all any of them were. Bedmates. Playmates. Just friends with benefits. That's what he called them. Friends with benefits. Rachel's trial begins on July 21st, 2010, and her defense again, it is self-defense. Specifically, she invokes Florida's Stand Your Ground law, which says deadly self-force or self-defense in certain situations is allowed. If you think that your life is in imminent danger, it's you or it's them and you choose you, then there's the law says you cannot be charged with murder. Well, Sarah had been threatening Rachel and she was scared, she says, and it was the whole reason she had the knife in her hand because she was certain that Sarah was going to give her the beat down of her life and she wanted to be ready. Well, that might have passed the smell test, except for one problem, and that is Rachel's own mouth. Remember that Rachel spent an inordinate amount of time psycho-calling Sarah like she was the, on the phone company payroll or something and leaving nasty voicemails constantly for Sarah? Well, during the trial, the prosecution played a series of voicemails from Rachel to Sarah where Rachel explicitly said she was going to kill Sarah. Seven months before she stabbed Sarah, Rachel left a voicemail saying, quote, I'm going to effing murder you. I'm going to beat you. Keep talking shiz. Keep effing with me, Sarah. Rachel would tell her friends, she'd tell Sarah's friends, quote, I'm going to effing kill that biatch. Former Pinellas County Prosecutor Lizette Hanowitz, who tried the case, told Max's sex and murder about the voicemails, quote, it showed no fear. It wasn't just the words that were said. It was how they were said. You do not contact somebody and threaten them if you fear them. That's. So those voicemails really cast Rachel in a whole new light, and it ain't a pretty one. As former news anchor Serena Faison notes in Sex and Murder, quote, that voicemail changed it all for Rachel Wade. When people heard that voicemail, you could see it in the jury. You could watch their faces. You could watch it in the audience. That voicemail was the most incriminating piece of evidence. Prosecutors called nine witnesses over two days before resting their case. Rachel's defense calls Josh to the stand, and it's fair to say that when the courtroom got a look at him, there was a little bit of, oh, wait, this is the guy? This is the guy who ignited all of this? I mean, for all of that, you would have thought that this guy would have looked like the love child of Morris Kojo and Morris Chestnut, but again, Josh is just an average looking guy and he's a scrub he's a scrub josh denies that he was instigating anything between sarah and rachel wise and then proceeds to get the worst ever case of amnesia basically claiming he didn't remember anything that anybody said or did i know nothing in other words he turns out to be a pretty useless witness Rachel testifies in her own defense, still clinging to the stand-your-ground defense, insisting that she was terrified of the taller and bigger Sarah. Finally, the defense rests, and the three-day trial is sent to the jury for deliberation. It takes them exactly three days to find Rachel guilty of second-degree murder. 
During her sentencing, Rachel gives a tearful statement expressing remorse for killing Sarah. However, Sarah's mother, Gay, does not buy not even one word, saying in her victim impact statement, quote, Rachel forgets that there are eyes and ears where she lives in the prison. Rachel brags about killing my daughter. She says my daughter deserved to be killed. She's not remorseful. Prosecutor Lizette Hanowitz concurs, telling sex and murder, quote, we had jail calls with her. She thought this was no big deal. She did not consider that she had taken a life. Rachel is sentenced to 27 years behind bars. She is serving her sentence at the Florida Women's Reception Center in Ocala and will be eligible for parole in 2032 when she is 42 years old. It's crazy, like mind-blowing even, to think that all of this happened over two teenage girls being manipulated by this run-of-the-mill player. That's what he was, run-of-the-mill average scrub. One girl murdered, the other behind bars. And as Tampa Bay Times reporter Lane DeGregory said in Crime Watch Daily, all it took was, quote, a love triangle and a little Applebee's knife. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Dark Side of Love. I am your host, Bianca Sloan, and show your love for The Dark Side of Love by visiting thedarksideoflove.com for show notes and transcripts. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to be notified about new episodes. And you can also find a link to my Patreon page where you can access bonus material and other fun stuff. Learn more about my suspense novels about the dark side of love by visiting BiancaSloan.com. Thanks for hanging out with me and join me next time for another tale of love gone wrong. I'll see you on the dark side. <laughs>